Brother, you gotta you gotta ref, you gotta re refresh my memory. When did we, uh, based on your recollection, when did we meet for real? Cause I think I think what I remember is I think we ran into each other at like a at like a hoop session. Yep. At uh, Cassidy. Cassidy. Yep. Yeah, man. I got the uh, friend of a friend invited me, so you're running. Right. And I, I just got out to Oklahoma, and I'm like, man, I'm at that time I probably I wasn't as washed as I am now, but I'm like, now I need to run, I need to do something. He's like, yeah, man, we got. Ex pros, ex college guys in here come run. I'm like, man, let me, all right, let me see what I still got. But yeah, man, that's cool, man, sir. I love that. And so, are you? You from Phoenix, Arizona, right? Am I yes, right? Sir. Born and raised. Born and raised. Yes, sir. All right. So, bring me up to speed from <laughs> that being home all the way to now. You're in Oklahoma, man. How in the hell does one go from Phoenix, AZ? Journey, man. man. Yeah, to um, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Well, I guess we'll start start at the beginning of the coaching stuff. So when I yeah. when I finished playing. Played up until JUCO uh, for college. Got the, the sad story. Got hurt. Mm. Tore a ligament in my hand, whatever, whatever. The whole sad story. But uh, got an opportunity to coach at Arizona State. Yeah. Industry friend, friend of a friend, you know, recommended me and they gave me an opportunity. Um, so, I, you know, I really wanted to coach. College coaching is my first real experience of, you know, seeing what a D1 coaching and all that stuff looked like. And it was a lot, but... Uh, you know, I really prided myself on whenever guys wanted to get in the gym, just let me know. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to work out, let me know. If you need a rebound, let me know, whatever you guys need. Um, and uh, a, a, at the time, a kid named Lou Dort shows up. He was a freshman at that time, so he was a – Hell of a name. Man. Yeah, five-star <laughs> out of Canada. Uh, I, I didn't really know much about him. Right. And uh, it, it really just started with being willing to, whenever he wanted to shoot, you know, whenever he needed anything in terms of court stuff was there for him. Mm -hmm. And naturally – he had a very, you know, coming to America and, and ups and downs and everything he went through with his college experience. I just did my best to, you know, be there when he needed me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our, our relationship grew pretty fast, you know, and I just all through hoop. Yeah. And while he was going through those ups and downs, you know, at one point his name was in the lottery. They were throwing his name. At another point he probably had a two, three-game stretch where it was like, man, this is, this is the worst he told me he'd ever played in his life. Oof. And I just tried to – stay solid through all that like I did with, with, with you know, the rest of those guys. But um, he decided to make the jump to go to the NBA. And we had gotten to the point where he was like, hey, you know, would you be interested in, in going with me? You know, holding me down out there wherever I end up going. I was like, yeah, man, I'm with you. You know, that's obviously a, a heck of an opportunity. Yeah. You know, at, at the time, like I said, I wanted to coach. But, you know, to be hit with that, I was like, man, I, all right, you know, why not? <laughs> no brainer. Yeah, like why not? So, um Fast forward, I mean, it, it, crazy experiences, even going through draft night, he ended up going undrafted. And you know, mm. a lot of people know his story. And that was a little bit of an anomaly in the fact of he might have been one of the best players to ever go undrafted in terms of, like, you know, what he was ranked and, you know, whatever they, they, they the info, the in, intel he had gotten from his agency about how teams looked at him. You know, there was, you know, without getting too far into detail, certain teams end of first round, beginning of second round, like, if he's there, we're taking him. Right. And, you know, you start getting to 30, 35, 40. And I'm, it, it's a crazy – it's exciting at first because I'm like, man, I don't know where, where we're going. Obviously, it's, it's his journey. But I'm like, you know, this is exciting. I could end yeah. up in Miami. I could end up in L.A. Who knows? Um, and then you start getting to 45, 50. I'm like, oh, this, is, this isn't as planned. It's an emotional roller coaster. Yeah, so that, was, like. that was weird, man. But he uh, ended up signing to OKC right after. They signed him like an hour after. They uh, signed him to a two-way. And it was the same thing of like – you know, I don't care if you were the first overall pick or this happened. Like, I'm, I'm riding with you regardless. So, mm -hmm. ended up coming out uh, with him and just, you know, same thing that I was trying to do at Arizona State of just being there. You know, you want to get in the gym, I'm in the gym with you. You know, with that experience, you know, it, you prepare for the draft. It's, you know, the high, the high. You're getting excited for, you know, who knows what, what may come. And then all of a sudden you're undrafted. And it was just, again, trying to make sure that, while he's on this emotional roller coaster, and this is kind of what I try to do with all the players I'm fortunate to work with, is they have so many highs and lows. I try to just be middle. Yeah, be you know, that constant. Be constant for him. And so we probably met, I'm trying to think, we probably met two, three months out of me being out here. Mm -hmm. um, and again, at that time, he was bouncing back and forth to the G League to um, got a little bit of time with the Thunder, made the most of that opportunity. Um, 
and I mean, made the most of the opportunity, I guess, is, is an understatement because, <laughs> you know, he, he, he took his opportunity and ran with it. And, you know, this is now he's now signed his extension. So this is now our fourth year out here. Mm. So, you know, I, I've uh, I live kind of an interesting life in the fact of I'll come out here during the season, you know, help him with whatever he needs and go back to Arizona where I'm from and try to make sure I'm still spending time with, you know, a lot of the uh, there's a lot of pros that spend time out in Phoenix. But there's a lot of, you know, kids that I've kind of seen grow up that was, you know, when I was first started doing player development, I was probably 19, 20 and they were mm. 13, 14. You know, and so now some of those guys are have moved on to play a different, whether it's, you know, a couple of D1 kids, some D2 kids, some mm-hmm. NAI kids, some JUCO kids, you know, whatever it is. Um, I live this interesting thing of almost two different ecosystems, two different lives, if that makes sense. One in Phoenix, one in Oklahoma City, so. But it's all about, it seems to be like all about just giving, though. I know that sounds super cheesy, but it seems, it seems like that's what you do. Absolutely, man. That's so h- how soon did you know you wanted to coach, man? Because that, that sounds – some people have that calling immediately, but then some people it sort of grows on them. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, no, it, <laughs> I, I kind of got told that when I was in, like, high school. Like, hey, man, you might, you might be a coach one day just because I've always been – I've always been that weird kid of, like, man, like I, I'm, I'm up to date and I watch every game. Yeah. I watch, you know, I was, I, I was the kid where a lot of kids would get excited about – I guess Friday night, Saturday night parties or whatever it is that was going on. I would look forward to the the TNT game, the ESPN game, the Sunday showcase on on ABC. Like that's just where it started. Um, and I think I started. I, I was a gym rat. You know, mm-hmm. again, this is not to get too much into you know, my playing story, but I just I really are we going my, into you know my my identity, <laughs> man. Like that's just that's all I knew was playing. Like whatever I was going through in life. Like same way. I mean, this gym's a perfect example, but it's just a sanctuary. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. When I started, first went to school, the AAU coaches had asked me, like, hey, do you want to come back and help in the summer? So I think coaching, like I, was, like I said, I was probably 18 at that time, and I was coaching, like, the little 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds. Primal age, by the way. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, and it's crazy. I still still have a relationship with a lot of those kids, but, like, being able to be like, wow, I have an impact on some of these kids, mm-hmm. like, seeing that, and then also having those two or three coaches in my life. I think we all have them, but those two or three coaches, knowing what they meant to me, yeah. And then be thrown into the chance of like, hey, you can be what they were to you. You can be that for this new next group of kids. Mm-hmm. That's I think that's probably where I fell in love with it. But you know, it start, some interesting stuff started happening in terms of like when I was in JUCO, my JUCO teammates were like, hey, Greg, you know, you know, can you, can you write a workout for me? Like, what workouts are you doing on the gun? You know, shooting machine stuff like that. While you were still active. While I was still playing with them, and I was like, well, this is what I mean: slide down threes, lift up three, like basic stuff, and then. Once I turned that corner um, in terms of like, yo, I want to do this for real. And the Arizona State stuff happened. It became like, hey, can you work me out? You know, can you can we get in the gym? Can we? And I was like, oh, this is when I was playing. I didn't understand like the business side of, I guess, what's now the player development industry. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I realized I'm like, yo, this is like, like you're going to pay me to get in the gym with you. Like that's 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 no brainer, really. OK, cool. And that was <laughs> it's funny because that was my biggest fear. Um, my biggest fear, I guess, when I was growing up was like I was so afraid of like what comes after basketball. Mm-hmm. Cause obviously that ball stops bouncing in my mind. I was like, well, you know, I love the ins and outs of the game in terms of preparation, all that stuff. I would love to maybe do like strength and conditioning. You know, I thought about doing something with that and then I'll just coach AAU again, being totally blind to the fact that there's a player development industry. Mm-hmm. Now at that time, I was a little bit different social media and all that stuff blew up. What is the training industry now? But, you know, to be able to see that, oh, there's a lane for this and take it, man. It was, it was, <laughs> like I said, when I, when I went into Arizona state, I was blind a little bit. I just knew that, hey, um, if you guys ever want to get in the gym, I'll get in the gym with you. That's how it started. That's how it started, man. I, mean, I guess that's <laughs> every opportunity I guess I've had in my life, every you know relationship in terms of mentors, coaches, friends, it's all kind of been in the gym. I don't know if that's healthy, but <laughs> that's that's the reality of it so far. So Well, listen, first of all, I think team sports is the greatest anyway. And in basketball, I'm biased and partial to yeah. that. So I can find about I – can, I, can I can see your craziness about yeah. it <laughs> yeah, so man. who gave you your first break as far as when it comes to the to the arizona state uh opportunity how did that come about so it was a uh it was a mentor i had um he he worked in the basketball industry but he was really close with those coaches mm-hmm. so he had uh linked me with them and again it was like a pretty low level you know manager slash ga role but kind of gave him like the hey you can trust him in terms of like um knows what he's talking about a little bit more than i guess regular managers, I guess would say not to discredit like managers, but like if you need him to run guys through workouts, like you can leave the gym and 
there won't be a bunch of nonsense going on. Got you. You know, so it was a couple of coaches and then, you know, my relationship grew with them, obviously, but that was probably the first real chance I got mm. um, in terms of a higher level beyond just, you know, AAU stuff and just took it and ran with it as best I could. So you would recognized an opportunity, even though it didn't necessarily have a big paycheck attached to it. Uh, man, that's, <laughs> I, I, I wish people would understand, like, you know, people are seeing there, there's a more, there's a, I'm trying to word this, you know, humbly is a little bit more of a cash flow coming in now. Mm -hmm. What people don't realize is that's stuff from four, five, six years ago. And like what I really, really prided myself on when I started to get more and more guys in the gym was it'd be like I found a niche a little bit in terms of guys that had just finished college playing at maybe low D1s or, or high D2s and we're trying to make the jump to overseas. Mm -hmm. And I think they didn't fully understand what that means. You know what I mean? It's their first real time where they're in the real world. You're not on scholarship. Not everything's covered for you. Right. And being willing to be like, look, man, I, I don't care about the money right now. Let's just let's do our best to try to get you your first opportunity overseas, whether mm -hmm. that's Finland, Germany, wherever your first little, you know, ideally first step is. Don't worry about whatever. You know, we would come up with, I guess, uh, something that, financially they could afford but again i was probably i was low balling it like i was whatever you can do we can just we'll make it work make it work you know and i just i really think that that's an important thing of like i never did this for the money mm -hmm. and i think that's something that i've tried to maintain as i've gotten more and more opportunities which some of them there's been more money attached to them but that's always like you know a, a secondary thing never been the driving force no nah, it's because it's comes and goes man it does it comes and goes and you know well it's cliche but they say you know time, money you can you can you can get back but time you can't you mm -hmm. know what i mean absolutely but realistically speaking we sort of need money to yeah. some degree in order to maneuver so my next question would be what was your support system like in the early stages of what you do now i mean what was mom and dad and what those your go-to people or were you really on your own having to piece it together and figure it out in the beginning i mean we we, I, I probably come from a home where I wouldn't say we, we, we were rich by any means, but I'm, I'm really, really fortunate to say we weren't poor. Nice. It was somewhere in between, but my parents really, you know, at a certain point were really like, they were big on having me figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I'm extremely fortunate of like, you know, I would say I have a little bit more of a safety net than some other people, but I also really prided myself of, I came from a household where, um, not a lot of people know this, but uh, my brother's mentally handicapped. Mm -hmm. So like my parents had a lot of, struggle with that growing up and over time you know things got better you know learning more and more about his conditions per se and actually for being all the way honest like some medicine improved like certain things that helped right. him like i seen what they had to go through and i really prided myself on like they have so much on their plate trying to take care of him that i'm not going to fall into this mindset of like they need to take care of me yeah and like i just i really got comfortable like i, I learned how to you know like I play Juco. Like, you have to budget. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? At that time, I, I, I tell people grind. this. Like, you can – I could teach you how to take $7 at Chipotle and make it three meals. That's mm. just, you know, in our, in our household and our Juco household, it was me and three other guys. Like, you know, and none of us had, you know, a lot of money like that. We just mm – -hmm. we made it work. So, like I said, I've, I'm fortunate to say that, like, we weren't necessarily – we didn't grow up poor, mm -hmm. but it also wasn't like things were just handed. It was like you have to figure this out. You know, whatever you want to do, like, we'll be there for you. We'll support it. You know, obviously get behind you, not necessarily financially, but just, you know, I guess emotionally, spiritually, whatever. But for sure. really, really push it in terms of that stuff. It's definitely a trip, man, To because uh, we're of age now, both of us. And I've been fortunate enough to have two parents and my description fits the same. Well, very similar to what you just said from a financial standpoint. I have that safety net if I need it. Mm -hmm. But the older I get, I need my parents in different ways now. Yep. Maybe not weekly allowance anymore, yeah. but I do need that guidance. <laughs> hey, have you dealt with this? How'd you deal with it? You know, yeah. give me some game. And I, it's a trip to see how those relationships evolve, man. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fascinating thing because, you know, my 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 dad, he's a big basketball fan. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it shifted where it went from being like, okay, they came to my games to now like they're always, you know, asking how certain players are doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's funny because I'll, I'll watch games sometimes. Like, Lou obviously is the one that my parents will watch the most because we'll watch all the Thunder games and stuff. And right. I'm, like, I'm like, Mom, why are you cheering louder for Lou than you cheer for me? And yeah, I'll give her a right. hard time. You know, <laughs> but she treat you know, they look at it the same way. Or I had, I've had a couple of girls. My, my parents are from uh, are from Portland, Oregon. Okay. So, like, I trained uh, one of the first girls. We can get into the girl stuff in a little bit. But it was Taylor Chavez. Mm -hmm. And so, my dad, like – him just, you know, loving, always watching the Blazers games. He would then watch all the Oregon games because mm -hmm. he knew like, hey, this is, 
oh, girls basketball's on. Who's that girl that Greg, you know, was able or works with? You know, oh, Taylor. Oh, can I see if she's doing, how yep. she's doing? So, I mean, it's, it's been interesting to watch just, just our dynamic shift from, like, them supporting, like, me personally and me and my teammates to now, you know, supporting everybody that I work with the mm-hmm. same way and asking about, you know, how's so-and-so doing? How's so-and-so doing? So that's, but that's, that's kind of how my parents always were. Like, my dad, obviously, coaching AAU and then being on, being at a power five and now, you know, coaching in college again, parents are a huge dynamic. Yeah. Obviously, you know, you, you coach in high school, just coaching in general, you know how it is. Mm-hmm. That stuff is so important. And my dad was really, really adamant about, again, extremely fortunate. My mom would like record games. I used to go back and watch my games when I was in seventh, eighth, ninth grade. And I'm, that's maybe really cool to go back and watch one day or maybe show my kids or whatever. But you would listen and my dad would like, he wasn't one of the AAU dads that's screaming about my accomplishments if I was playing well. It was more so like cheering on other kids. That's so unique, man. And it's like, but that like that mindset, I guess, stays with me. So it's like, for example, right now, these players I'm working with, like it's their career. Mm-hmm. And I always try to make sure it's like, how can I help you in your career? Like, it's, this isn't all about me. Mm-hmm. And I think having a set of parents that were like, you know, there for me, but then also it wasn't always about me. It was like, how else, like, what are you doing to help the team? Like my dad, I don't even know my dad remembers this, but he did something so... So it, it still sticks with me to this day, and maybe I'll do it with my kids one day. But we had a uh, we had an AAU tournament that we lost, and I remember. I mean, I don't know. I was probably playing with like a, our whatever club's B team, or maybe whatever who I was playing with. We we didn't. Everybody else didn't play well, but based on this how this conversation went, I probably didn't play as well as I could have either. And I remember, like, I started to be like, oh, well, so into the blame game. So-and-so yeah. didn't do this. So-and-so didn't do this. Or so, we, we would have won if this happened. <laughs> so and common. I, yeah. And he, I remember he, like, obviously in the front seat of cars, he, like, flipped the mirror down. Yeah. You know, the, the sunshade and then flipped the mirror up. And mm-hmm. that became, like, a thing in my mind of, like, before I can talk about anybody else, like, I have to look myself in the mirror first. Mm-hmm. And that, I guess, translates to, to player development now where I'll be like, okay, well, you know, if so-and-so is not shooting well or not playing well or they're turning the ball a lot, like, Turning, excuse me, I turn the ball over a lot. How can I, instead of being like, oh, well, this didn't happen or this didn't happen or this didn't happen, how can I figure out how to help them through that? Yep. You know what I mean? Like always, I don't know, just just give first, like you said earlier. I love that, man. And it's, it, we got to learn how to do it because we can take ourselves too seriously sometimes <laughs> and we can have trouble just not getting over ourselves, Yeah. you know? But to, to the coaching standpoint, I'm going to rewind just a little bit. It sounds like you got started when you were, what, maybe 19, 20 years old? Yeah, 19, 20 years, yes, sir. Well, and you're at the college level. So these are guys that are pretty much your same age, maybe yeah. some a little younger, maybe some a little older. Mm-hmm. How did you figure out how to communicate with those guys? Because obviously being the same age, yeah. it's hard to come <laughs> in and you know, rule them by the yeah. iron fist. I mean, it was, a, it was an interesting dynamic. So um, I think what gave a little – validity to what I was I guess preaching per se is like mm-hmm. I would be when they showed up at the gym if our practice was at 9 a.m me and uh, another one of my teammates we would always get there at like 7 30. okay we'd always there early and like that was kind of uncommon it's not I mean a lot of juco kids need to do it but not a lot of juco kids do do it mm-hmm. um so I think it was like okay well like the reason why I can maybe give advice on what workout to do is like you just walk like you just walked in the gym and I just finished that same workout mm-hmm. you know what I mean so it's like nothing that I'm suggesting you to do is nothing that I'm not going through also, mm-hmm. you know, but then just the other side of it too was like, they were big on anytime I got a FaceTime call, Hey, what you doing? Oh, I'm watching this game. I'm watching this. I'm, I'm, I'm always watching something, you know what I mean? With basketball, like the, the obsessiveness, excuse me, obsessiveness over it, I think made them be like, you know, Oh shit. Like he really loves this. He loves it. He's, he's with it. Yeah. So <laughs> I guess that's probably where a little bit of that. How'd you draw the line between how close you could be? to those guys on a personal level, you know what I mean? Outside of work, whenever it's time to do some social things like that, how do you figure out like, ah, maybe I should keep my distance or like, you know what, I can rock with y'all when we're doing this. Yeah, um, I mean, I've, I'm a little bit of an anomaly in the fact of like, I've, I've never drank alcohol in my life. So mm. like, if we're, you know, if we're gonna be honest about, you know, certain college dynamics, like that, right. that's part of the, you know, it's part of the experience. True. So like, I was always big on like, you know, even though I don't necessarily engage in some of the stuff that goes with this, right. I'll still go with you guys. Gotcha. But the flip side of that is like, yeah, we can, you know, we can have whatever kickback, we can hang out, whatever. But like, I'm going to the gym in the morning. Yeah. So like, and I'm expecting you to go too. Uh huh. No matter and, how hard you went. Yeah. That's I mean, like, and you, you can do whatever you want again, like as long as everybody's safe. And you know, I, I kind of hold that same standard now with like some of the players I coach. Is like, you know, Monday through Saturday we're gonna work out, and then whatever you choose to do after, as long as you know it's not a problem until it's a problem. 
And as long as it's not affecting you on the court, as long as I try to hold that same standard, mm -hmm. like with those guys of like, you know, hey, we can do whatever. You know, we can celebrate a big win. We can do whatever we want. But if we're losing, we're not. Well, I'm not going out with you guys. Like, no. I'm not. It's not. You know, what are we celebrating? What are we celebrating? Right. So, you know, it's finding that balance. You know, I think uh, I think the interesting part is a lot of people try to like hide that part of like what goes on in the basketball world. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather be more transparent about it with my players. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, don't don't lie to me about what you did last night or whatever. Like, let's be honest. So that way we can move yeah. forward with it. You know, and it's a little right now, for example, me coaching at, at you know, Southern Nazarene, that's a little different because like the rules that are at the university, like a little different, right? Like there's a quite different. Yeah. They don't drink. They don't, you know, that's, that's not, that's not allowed. So again, we're going to stick to that. That's thousand percent. But mm -hmm. then if I work with some of my pro guys, it's a little bit different of a situation in terms of like, you guys are grown men. Yeah. Half of them are older than me. So it's there like, okay, go. look, <laughs> you're a grown man. As long as, as long as you're on time for your workout and you're not, this isn't regressing your development, then we're good. Handle your business, you know? There's a human element that goes into everything. And I think you just tapped into that. Nobody wants to be just flat out dictated to. Mm -hmm. And we, we all got to have a life. And for each person, that looks different. Mm -hmm. Because you said what you don't do may be something that's in this guy's wheelhouse. But hey, that's, hey man, listen, enjoy yourself. Yeah. But then let's go to work. Yeah, absolutely, man. So were you given a role, per se, once you first started coaching? Or did you basically just carve a lane out for yourself? Carved it. I mean, so, mm. you know, I was a... Uh, the label they gave me was I still had to finish my undergrad because mm -hmm. I went from JUCO to, to that. And so um, it when was you say that, you talking about Arizona State? Yeah. So I uh, finished playing at JUCO and then I went right into Arizona State, like right okay, after. Gotcha. And I, you know, I had the I had played well enough to, you know, have like that, that couple opportunities of going and playing at like NAI, sorry, NAI level. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like, OK, cool. Like, you know, this could be an opportunity. But then I'm looking at it like that's cool. But if I want to coach long term, this is a crazy opportunity to just start. You know, again, at the time, I didn't fully understand what it was. I just think in Power Five, you know, there's obviously an opportunity to get around some great players. Like, I'm going to just take it around with it. it. You know, I really want to coach. You know, like, let's do it. So, you know, I, I came in on, like, a student manager role. But, again, there was that little behind the scenes of, like, hey, we can trust you a little bit more than maybe some of the other managers, per se, that maybe don't come from a basketball background. Mm -hmm. They're more of just, like, student life or guys that want to be a part of something or whatever. Again, which is totally cool. That was all part of, like, their journeys. Sure. Um, so, I guess the the, the – Industry, a way, I guess, of looking at it was like I was a manager, but was kind of given GA responsibilities and I helped with some film stuff behind the scenes and just stuff. I try to stay within the rules of everything, obviously. Sure. But I think that's that's what it was. And then again, it was just like really, really taking the initiative of like, if those guys want to get in the gym, I'm with them. If they want to work out, I'm going to have it prepared. And obviously, you played and you coach. You know how it is. Of if I come in and I'm on nonsense, I'm on, I'm on bullshit. Oh yeah. That's going to spread quickly. Flip side of that is if I come in and handle my business and guys leave the gym, like, dang, we went for 30 minutes, but I, like, I got in what I needed to get in, or mm -hmm. I got better, I got, you know, I think the biggest compliment is, like, I got pushed today, like, I was uncomfortable. Like, that, I think, was how I kind of carved that niche out a little bit, yep. and then it just, it took off. And I'm guessing, you know, the head coach and those above you on the totem pole saw how you were working, right? Yeah, no, they, I mean, it was one of those... <laughs> They didn't say much about it, but it was one of those things of like they might leave the gym, be like, oh, Greg, make sure you get, you know, so and so in today. He didn't shoot well. Mm -hmm. And you know how it is when you talk about power five coaches, and these are coaches that, you know, have really been around it, mm -hmm. to be given that green light is like, because that same way, they know there's some nonsense going on, like they're quick to cut it. Yep. So the fact that I got that little bit of like, hey, you got so and so after, by the way, or pregame, I need you to make sure so and so gets trail threes up. Okay, cool. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's a very little thing in terms of the grand scheme of things, but to be given that trust made me feel like, hey, maybe I, maybe I do know what I'm talking about a little right. bit, you know, because it's one thing for players to be like, hey, I got a great workout in today because, you know, we could work out right now and I could throw you through 80 dribble combo moves and a whole bunch of nonsense. And you'd mm -hmm. be like, man, I'm tired. I got work in. But if a coach sees that, he's going to be like, what are we doing? What are we doing? You know, so <laughs> to be able to kind of get the, the nod from both sides, the player and the coach's side was like, okay, well, maybe I can, maybe I can do this for real. You earned some credibility right there. Yes, sir. So. Did you deal with any egos at any point? The first one I had to deal with was my own, I think. Really? Was, yeah, absolutely. Going from, going from a player, mm -hmm. and again, I had to learn how to – it's no longer about you. It doesn't matter how good you were or weren't. Like, mm -hmm. it's now about this player. It's now about this player. Right. You know? Like, the, the group of guys, um, I guess name dropping, obviously Lou, but like mm -hmm. Rob Edwards, who, who was here actually last year with the Oklahoma City Blue. Right. Workaholic. And it's like, look, Rob's not – when Rob says, hey, let's get some shots up, Rob's not trying to hear about, 
you know, what I did or didn't do, do, or I got this, like, nah, he wants to get his work in. Zylan Cheatham, who's also from Phoenix, who's a workhorse also, same thing. Like, those guys want to get better. Like, I had to quickly be like, yo, you don't, like, <laughs> I know you play, but it's not about that anymore. It's about getting these guys. Right. And so that was the first one I had to deal with. And then, I mean, with players, it's always, it's always that little bit of that you have to build the trust. Mm -hmm. But I think egos, I've learned with players, is a lot of that stuff is like, it's a wall. It's a door a little bit you have to open because once they see like, hey, you've let me into your space and you see that I'm not just trying to use you for your platform or, you know, whatever, whatever. Like, I actually care about your development. Like, I'll answer that 10, 11 o'clock phone call like, hey, I want to get in the gym. Right. That's how you get over that. You know Good what I mean? And, and that's, that's, I think, what, again, what I try to pride myself on is whatever they need, I'm there. And I think, you know, the ego thing has been an interesting thing because... I'm in a very unique situation in terms of like being the right hand next to an NBA player. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in that position care more about the life. Like they want their yes men and they want everything that comes with the life. Yeah. I really try to pride myself on all the players that I work with of not being that, no matter what level you are, whether right. you're 13 years old or whether you're an NBA veteran, holding them to the same standard of like, no, you were late. You know what I mean? Or like, yo, you're, you're, you're BSing right now. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that if you're willing to stand on that, like a lot, a lot of trainers aren't, you know, that's the difference I think between trainers and player development. A lot of trainers are just like, hey, let's get our workout in. Player development is more of like developing a workout we can develop, but like developing you as a person. Mm -hmm. and so I you're think being human with them. Being honest with them, yeah. Human, being human, being honest. And that's what I've learned is I'm going to tell you, like, I'm going to be your biggest supporter in terms of like when you, when you kill, when you finally get that opportunity, I'm going I'm to cheer louder than anybody. But then on the flip side of that, if you're, if you're slacking off, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, and if, if that, that honesty doesn't work with them, then we're probably not going to work with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not just with players. I think that's just with people in my life. Because I don't want – I got the, – the people that I think mean the most to me in my life are the ones that were honest with me. Yeah. Even if it wasn't what I wanted to hear at that time, I needed to hear it. You can respect it. Absolutely. You know, well, once we get over how we feel about it in the moment, it's like, you know what? Damn, he was right. Shit. Yeah. But it's like medicine sometimes. You know, it don't always taste good. Yeah, you're right. That was my <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. So you said a moment ago it's not about you. It doesn't necessarily matter what your, um, what your past was, how good you were or how good you weren't. But on the flip side, mm -hmm. there is this thing I used to hear. I, I think I can't even remember who the guy is. Matter of fact, it was one of my superiors, one of, one of my mentors. Mm -hmm. He was making reference to, and I'm not going to use names, but he was making reference to somebody who didn't necessarily play ball, at least not at a high level, mm -hmm. but he was then coaching. Yeah. And he was comparing this guy to me who did play. Absolutely. And, and he was like, he, he called him a book, a book learner. Yeah. And I, I, know what, I knew what he meant. And I sort of laughed, but in my mind, as me and this book learner continued to work together, he knew his shit. Yeah. And it's like, OK, so even though he didn't necessarily play, that doesn't mean that he's not still a student of the game. Yeah. So did you is that a real thing? Like somebody could second guess you because, OK, you didn't play. What do you really know? Yeah. You know I mean, I mean? The, the, the way that I look at it is like, OK, so I'm a you know, I'm, I'm five, eight, not jumping with T-Rex arms. You know what I mean? But what I will do is like I, I feel like I could really, you know, handle the ball. Like we, we do some stuff like you when you first walk in the gym. You could tell someone got a little flow, a little wiggle mm -hmm. to them. Yep. But I think, you know, one thing is like. I'll never try to teach something that I can't do. I can't show you. That's mm. big with, with older players, especially, Good point. you know what I mean? There's that, but then it's also like, especially locally around Phoenix, like knowing like, Oh yeah, I used to play with G. I used to watch G play. I used to like, whatever it is, there's a little bit of credibility in that. Mm -hmm. And then it also becomes like where I've really, really, I guess, carved a niche out or been fortunate enough is part of this living with an NBA player aspect is I go to all the home games. Right. I go to all the games. I watch all the games. And so it's like, Whatever, you know, two things. One, whatever maybe I couldn't do because of, you know, I didn't play D1. But it's like I was able to get to college with all the things I just said. So right. like there has to be a base there. But then it's also like whatever I couldn't do or, you know, whatever I want to get better at, like I watch more hoop than anybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? I spend my hours. Flat out junkie. You know what I mean? So it's like that balance of like they're absolutely right in terms of I think there is a base level that needs to be there. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of – can be you know the book stuff and then mm -hmm. that middle ground is whatever you make it right you know what i'm saying like there's there's really spending hours and hours and hours like watching and learning and all that stuff it's like that i think makes up that that mm -hmm. gap if that makes sense you Bridges know that gap. Good, good way to put it that makes a lot of sense but i think that having the 
so for example, right now we just finished preseason, mm -hmm. but it's like I tell my girls, you know, I mean, I won't tell them this in a team environment, but I've talked to some of the girls who've been like, yo, this is what we did in conditioning. Because I had a couple, you know, I guess coaches you could say around the crazier end of the spectrum in terms of conditioning. But it's like nothing you guys are doing I haven't been through before. Mm -hmm. And then I've learned what I wanted to hear in that moment that did work for me. And then what also motivated me when I went through that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like we had hell week and Juco, all this crazy stuff. And it's yeah. like, yo, I wasn't trying to hear this, but I remember so-and-so telling me this. Right. So let's get rid of this stuff. And then, you know, I think when you see – you, you could tell. That's the other thing I think I'll say in terms of like with pro guys, especially. I already mentioned it a little bit, but if I was in here and didn't know what I was doing, it would have spread really, really quick. That's yeah. not just me. That's all trainers. Yeah, it wouldn't take them long to figure it out. Yeah, either. but the flip side of that is like once you get two or three or four or five, it turns into six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It starts doubling, it starts tripling where it's like, OK, you know, he knows his stuff. Like he really mm -hmm. loves this. He'll spend his time. He played like, you know, little pro tricks. There's just certain parts of the game where if you don't if you didn't play, like you, if you've never been looked off when you're open, like mm -hmm. that should have been an extra pass that I didn't get and yeah. you went and missed it, like you don't know how it feels. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't know how to – you clearly got fouled, you fell, you should have got that call, but okay, well, I got to get back up and keep playing. Like yeah. we've all been through that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's an interesting dynamic, but I think where you make up with, with that is, is it's not the end-all be-all, but it does matter a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I it feel just, you. just depends on the person. And then the, the communication piece, I don't think we can – I don't think we can harp on that enough. So I don't think you can treat everybody the same because mm -hmm. everybody's not the same. So have you figured out how you need to approach this guy? Okay, maybe this approach works for him and maybe it would be a turnoff to this guy. Have you figured have you had to deal with that going through the trial and error? Yeah. And I think it's even heightened working with girls. Mm. You know, obviously coaching girls now, it's a, it's a, the way you communicate with them isn't necessarily the same. You, you, you know, you can obviously with guys, right? Not all, I mean, you know, there's, there's a, there's a spectrum of that, but I think it's being honest with certain guys. You know what I mean? So, like, with some guys, I know I know that some guys need that extra motivation. Yep. Some guys do better if you just – here's the workout. You know what I mean? Some guys are – you know, that's just their machines. Mm -hmm. Some guys you got to pick up, but it's finding, like, that in-between of, like, finding what gets them to go. And it, that's that takes time. But I think the initial – I guess foundation I start with with players is, is the work, mm -hmm. right? So like, we'll start with simple drills, but like, I'm going to be locked in with you. I'm going to be intense. I'm going to have film to show you. I'm going to have everything you need to where we don't got to be buddy, buddy. Right. And then naturally, you know, day one turns to day two, day two turns to day three. And then, you know, they start opening up a little bit in terms of here's going, here's what's going on with my life. Here's what, and you start learning the person. Yeah. What motivates them? What do they like hearing? What do they not like hearing? And that's a two way street in mm -hmm. terms of, Okay, some guys, this is what you don't want to hear, but this is what you need to hear. Mm -hmm. Other guys, like, yo, I'm not going to waste time telling you that. You know that. Mm -hmm. You know, it just it depends on the player. But I think that's the fun part of this whole thing is, like, that's what I really enjoy Yeah, is figuring out what might be the same message is said differently to different people. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of that is, especially the team environment, is I, I hold our best players to the same standard as I do our freshmen that are coming yeah. in who may not – I mean, not our freshmen, just players that may not get a lot of playing time early – to, to the girls that are going to play 35 minutes a game. I have some things that are non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think when they see that, both sides of that, then they realize, like, okay, you know, I'm not getting picked on, and I'm also not getting, like, oh, I'm getting really, really attacked, per se, yeah. and then this player is not, you know, they're not holding them accountable. I try to make sure, like, being on time, effort. That ball's a loose ball. I don't, you're on the floor. I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you average 25 or, you, or this is your first time playing. Right. Like, we're, we're like, there's just some certain things that I, I – I can't not allow mm -hmm. and things that I can't allow. That makes sense. No, it, it does. And I think it hits way different whenever you get on the better players. Mm -hmm. And whenever you turn the heat up with them, the rest of them, maybe number 12 on the depth chart is like, oh, well, I know I have, I don't have a chance to cut a, cut a corner if the big dog just got it. Yeah, I mean, that's, and that's the thing, too. I tell, our, I tell our girls all the time, like, look, it's more of a problem if I'm not coaching you. Yeah. So you might come into practice and be like, man, like, Coach, you know, just speaking about me, like, Coach G is hard on me or, like, every little thing he's on me. But it's like, yo, like, that's, like, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The second that I stop coaching you, that's when you need to start worrying. That's when you need to start getting a little more anxious. Yeah. You know? I'm on you. I see something there. Yeah. Okay, so how in the hell did you end up at SNU right now? <laughs> Southern Nazarene. So, Southern Nazarene. Yeah, let's, let's go back a couple years. So Yeah, yeah. Bring me um, up to speed. 
again, and you know, not to not to name drop him too much, but you know, it was it was a phone call I got from Lou, um, and he had mentioned his his cousin Sean. It's not his blood cousin, but like we call him his cousin because they they have the same birthday. They're from the same block. Like they're from totally like get yeah, they're 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 <laughs> as close as you can get, man. Right. So he called me and he was like, hey man, like Sean, they were AAU teammates, but he was like, Sean's just having trouble finding a school. He had tore his, uh, tore his ACL right out of high school, sorry, right out of prep. Like, mm. just things didn't line up. And he was like, we got we to gotta figure this out. So I'm like, okay, well, I don't have a lot of film on him. And the film that I had wasn't great quality. And I'm like, we're going to have to really make something out of nothing here. So I just cold emailed every college coach in Oklahoma. Just sent out an email. Um, okay, now, did you know anything about this guy's game? Did you know personally, okay, this kid can play, we just can't show yeah, it? Yeah, I, I could tell by the film, like okay. a little bit of film, and again, I'm going off of Lou's recommendation because <laughs> a lot of pro guys are like this, but like Lou won't say someone can go if they can't go. Gotcha. And then I also talked to, they had the same AAU coach, and he's very big on like, he understands the, the importance of like, if I recommend this kid and this kid is not good, like it that that's obviously in the coaching world that can tear yeah, apart relationships. Oh yeah. You know, so I, I really took their word for it and then I made sure that I got I got in the gym um before he did any workouts for any coaches. I was able to get in the gym with him a couple of times and I could see it. Oh, like, yeah, okay, now this kid could go. You know, so um I had a couple of coaches respond to me, um and it was really on the basis of like, look, we he just needs a workout. That's all I'm asking for. You know what I mean? Like we'll take care of his flights, getting them out here, like whatever, whatever. And so S and the, the staff at SNU was one of the people that gave him an opportunity. And it was just a cold cut workout. One of their assistants worked him out. And it's funny because he, uh, he missed his first like two layups in the workout. And I'm thinking like, oh, like, here, here, we go. Go. here goes my reputation. This, yeah. is, this is not good. First and two layups, wide open. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was rough. But then all of a sudden, like starts making shots, starts making shots. And he ended up, they ended up going, they did a uh, three-point drill. I think they shot 10 at five spots and he shot like, 43, 44 from three. Mm. And I'm like, yo, like, he, he, you know, like, I think it's right. a big blessing, but he, he hit the switch. Yeah. So they ended up offering him a scholarship. So Sean now plays at SNU, which is cool. Um, he lives with me and Lou, but it's really my guy. And so same thing, he's a workaholic. And so two, two weeks into his season, his freshman year, he tore his ACL, tore his other ACL. Yeah. Yeah. That one hurt. Um, Damn it. So he went through his rehab process, and then he was able to get back in the gym. If he toured in September, I think we got back in the gym like February, mm. January. I don't remember exactly, but we started working him back. And so uh, that Coach May. That actually seems like – I'm sorry to cut you off, but I had yeah. to say this before I lose that thought. It's like that seems like not that long. Yeah. We've well, come he, a long way medically. It was, it was slow. Like it was, we weren't – we were barely moved, like form shooting. Okay, like it started, okay, okay, it started okay, with just, you. like, little stuff. And, yeah. you know, obviously the, uh, the men's coaches understood, like, my relationship with him. So they, they let me, like, work with him a little bit. And mm. they knew, I, you know, like I was aware of what was going on. We weren't doing no nonsense or whatever. Sure. Um, and so we were just in the gym. He started to progress and was able to do more and more and more. April – end of March, April starts coming around and um, – I ended up connecting with the women's coach. He used to always see us in there. We just, we didn't really talk much. Um, but I went up and introduced myself. Uh, you know, hey, Coach May, like, my name's Greg. I, you know, I work with Sean a little bit. Just wanted to introduce myself. I, I, I love the girls' game. Um, this was after I just finished a summer working with some of the girls. We get to talking, ends up he coached at Grand Canyon University, which is in Phoenix. He's mm -hmm. like, oh, you're from Phoenix? Hi, boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, oh, that's crazy. Like, you know, I, I – I named four girls that I, I were the first four girls I ever trained. Three of them he had offered at GCU. Wow. I'm like, oh, this is, okay, this is weird. You know, stars, so I text, texted the girls. Just, yeah, weird. It was weird, man. And so, you know, we, conversation went well, just like, oh, you know, good, good, you know, good to meet you. I'll see you around, whatever. And then from there, you know, he started watching a little bit in terms of what I was doing with Sean. He was like, I like some of this stuff. Because, again, I was very, keep in mind, like, I'm in, I'm in their gym and, like, very big on like, what do you guys need Sean to work on? Like, mm -hmm. oh, he's gonna be playing the pick and roll a lot. Okay, cool. And as a college coach, he was watching our reps and seeing like, I'm not some trainer that's in here, you know, recording every workout we're doing, doing 12 dribble combo moves to a bunch of BS finishes. Like we're right. working on game rep stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And he, he just saw like the consistency. And I think the, the intensity, I guess I was bringing to every session from even if we were just form shooting, because that's all he could do when we first got in the gym mm -hmm. after his injury. But the seeing like the focus and like that we were really locked in. Everything we was intentional. Consistent. Yeah. So we just get to talk and he's like, you know, what do you got going on next year? What are you doing? I find out his uh, his GA was graduating. 
so she had moved on to you know whatever whatever endeavor she wanted to get into and it was kind of just like a hey would you be interested and so, you know, fell in this interesting situation of like, I had a couple other, I guess, situations that were brewing per se, opportunities maybe that may or may not have, you know, were possibly gonna line up. Mm -hmm. But I was like, man, like if I could coach here, stay, you know, continue to work with Sean and then also continue to do the things I do for Lou, like this is kind of a cool little setup we could get here, man. Yeah. So I uh, ended up getting that, 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 I guess, deal done, but ended up, you know, coming to terms with it. And it's been, it's been amazing, man. It's been a blessing. I got to ask you the cliche question, man. Yep. Uh, the difference between coaching women versus coaching men. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> coaching, I, as, as, you know, I guess I'm supposed to say this, but I think I genuinely enjoy girls more mm -hmm. um, because it's all skill work. So, like, if you're a player development coach, you're a skill developer, like, you <clears> can't <throat> not love it because the challenges it brings is obviously – as a whole, they're more, or sorry, they're less athletic, mm -hmm. which means we have to figure, we have to, you know, we have to develop your skill more. Mm -hmm. And so being able to do that, like it, it's really presented some challenges, you know, as we were talking earlier, but like there's a feel for the game that I think guys naturally have a little bit more of. And, you know, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit, but like, I think guys, like you grow up, you, you play pickup three times a day. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's, and you're there's, gonna watch it too. You're gonna watch it. You got like, you know, you, the, the, amount of just talent hoop you can just watch you can go anywhere and watch hoop girls obviously don't have that as much and it's changing thankfully it's changing mm -hmm. but i think that's the biggest difference is like it's less athleticism it's more skill based and like taking the challenge of okay you've watched you you grew up playing less because you didn't have as much pickup runs you didn't have like it's just it's just less in general how can i implement and add to your game mm -hmm. Like, what, what do I need to add to it? So I've learned, like, visually, girls are much more visual than guys, in my experience, at least. So, like, guys, like I said, we can come off a pick and roll. I want you to skip and read, or there's certain things that they'll do naturally. With girls, they don't necessarily, like, they've never been taught that before. Mm -hmm. So I really, really rely on film with girls. And, I mean, guys, too, obviously, but girls, it's another notch. Right. And it's, like, it's little things of, like, even with guys, like, if you really pay attention to it, you'll notice a lot of girls can't shoot, like, an inside foot pull-up. So like if I'm going downhill and going to my left and you're supposed to, you know, plant your right foot and yeah, raise up, right like girls have to put their left foot down. Right-handed girls have to go left, right, mm -hmm. no matter what angle they're going at. And that like drives me crazy. Oh, yeah. And I don't it's, know what that is, but it's just like it's little things that I've just I don't know. It feels so net. It feels so natural to them. But when you look at it, it's so unorthodox. Like you're going to step on your feet, baby. Yeah, it drives, <laughs> it drives me crazy. But that's like it presents this challenge that I really like, you know, and I think with girls, too, it's um, it's the trust factor is even more, especially yeah. with me being a, a young male, like there's a certain trust that has to be built. Mm -hmm. But then the same thing, like guys all have like their guy. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this guy works out with this guy, this guy works out with this guy. Right. Girls, I think there's a lot less of that available. Mm -hmm. And so once you get two or, th what, what I guess happened to me was like, I had two or three of, really fortunate that the two or three girls I started working with were I guess more of the upper echelon in Arizona. Mm -hmm. But then what started happening is like other top girls were seeing like, okay, well, She's working with him consistently. So obviously there's some trust there and she's getting better. So like, what's going on over here? Cause it's hard for me to find somebody that's willing to get in the gym with me and really yeah. commit to my development. So I think that was a niche I kind of carved out where I'm looking around and I'm like, yo, like there's nobody really focusing on girl stuff out here. I shouldn't say nobody. There's a couple of really good guys out in Arizona. Right. But like to take that and try to up it even more, uh -huh. you know, and it, it's just, it, it's been a, an a interesting uh, lane that, I've been fortunate to kind of get some momentum in because mm -hmm. the men's side, man, the men's side, you know how it is. There's a new trainer every day. There's a pop-up trainer every day. There's a yeah. TikTok trainer every day. It's extremely saturated. Mm -hmm. With girls, I'm like, look, I'm going to approach this and, and push this as far as we can and try to just 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 make this to where let's emphasize girl development. And I'm starting at home, obviously, with Arizona, mm -hmm. and then see if, if this can get taken up nationwide. Right. Because girl, girls can hoop, man. Yeah, That's they the, can. <laughs> And, and maybe on a smaller scale, speaking from my own experiences, from just at, at the high school level and the AAU level, girls seem to trust sooner than the fellas do. That's yeah. what I've noticed. You know, the guys, I mean, like, well, we got to We're going to improv out the gate. Mm -hmm. We got to touch that stove. Keep burning that hand a little bit. And yeah. then I've had some moments as a coach to where it's like, all right, it may take from when we first start the official practice in October. Mm -hmm. The trust may not start to show until we get into January sometimes. Yeah. And now after they've done if after they've done it their way a bunch, 
now the game is hanging in the balance and they're looking at me like, Coach, what you got for us? I'm like, oh, so so now you know, right, I got you. Yeah, like, yeah, give me the board, all right. <laughs> yeah. But girls, the buy-in seems to take place a little bit sooner. To that, you would say what? No, absolutely. I mean, it's it's one of those things where like, I think I think it's a little bit harder to get them to trust at first mm. than it is guys. But in terms of the depth of their trust, once girls trust you, they trust you. Got you. If that makes sense. It might take a little bit way. to get there, yeah. but once you get there, like they they will. With guys like. I mean, I got a bunch of pro clients that like they're clients, you know, like I wouldn't say they're necessarily like I, I probably majority of the girls I train like we they're, they're friends like they're real. You know what I mean? Like they're, they'll call me. I get a lot of call like guys. They'll call me and be like, hey, can you watch my film? Can you give me a recommendation about whatever? I get a lot of girls will call me and be like, hey, like and it's life stuff. Basketball, too. But like they, they once they really trust you, like it, it becomes a, a real big brother dynamic, if that makes sense. That's got to be super rewarding, man. Yeah, man, that's that's the because that, that's that's what I was fortunate to have was having coaches, a couple that I still talk to to this day of like they really helped me through life experiences. Yeah. Basketball, basketball stopped me. I love it to death. It, it's, sure. it's giving me everything I have. Mm -hmm. But I also understand there's more to life than just that. But being able to, to, to be the one that they call for certain things is like, man, like this is this is cool. You know what I mean? I remember when you didn't know my last name, but now you're calling me to ask about, you know, <laughs> just, just all who knows, all type of stuff. So it's been cool, man. Right. Speaking of, you know, I asked this to, to, to players who have the experience of playing overseas. What is how does that process get going? Let's say <laughs> if, if I'm a player that's been under your tutelage, right, yep. whether you coached me or you trained me or both. And I'm like, you know what? I want to give this a go. I think I, I think I think I can make it happen. I'm definitely not ready to be done playing. Mm -hmm. I want to go play abroad. What's the first order of business, man? Walk me through that whole process. What is it supposed to look like? It, it's unfortunate a little bit in a lot of situations, but who you know matters. Okay. Your agent, like that's that's a big thing is your agent, and it's more so just getting the opportunity. Now, that's not the end-all, be-all. I've seen guys make it happen without an agent mm. or a little help from an agent, but having somebody to just get your foot in the door. But this goes back to the money thing, and I try to tell guys, like, this is the real most guys, and I mean, there's except you talk about Euro Cup, Euro League, like there's certain levels where high D1 guys or a lot of like low tier NBA guys will make that jump. That's a little mm -hmm. bit different. But if you're talking about guys that are D2 All-Americans or played at, you know, whatever University of California, whatever, whatever, insert, you know, school here, like small D1s, like they have to understand like your first job might be, you might make $700 a month. Ooh, hey. You know, I mean, like maybe your house is covered, your car is covered, but yeah. that's the reality of it. Right. And so you have to be willing to go through that first year mm -hmm. and like understand that like it's a business. So if you go out there and don't perform, you're getting cut and they're replacing you. Mm -hmm. And like, especially being an American, like they'll give you a lot of guys want like you're our athlete or you're our scorer. Like it's very cut and dry and you have to perform. And if you don't, they're going to cut you and bring another American in. And I don't think they fully under, like a lot of people don't understand because they'll come from situations of like, I was a D1 athlete, like I was on scholarship, everything was paid for, my housing, my food. So now all of a sudden that stopped and you want to push this for real, like it, it gets real. And you have to be willing to, like if you love this, like the game's going to test you. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, that, that's a big, I guess, thing that I've learned in this whole thing on, on all fronts. Like it's going to, how much do you love it for real? And I'm going to be honest, like and I, a lot of my guys have heard this conversation. I ask them, like, do you like basketball? Do you love basketball or do you like being a basketball player? Like, do you love the game? That's do you love heavy. the grind? Do you like, or do you like everything that comes with it? Do you like, I, I clown guys sometimes, but do you like your social media profile being like, you know, pro baller, pro, you know, pro hoop or whatever. It's a nice tag. But you never got a pay stuff from a pro basketball club. So how are you a pro hooper? You know what I mean? And it's like, yo, you, you have to put two, some guys two, three, four years in before you get your real money making job. Mm-hmm. And, and guys, guys fall in love with that idea of being a player more than they fall in love with, like, what it actually takes to be one. Because it's hard, man. You got to keep in mind, like, you're going into countries where you're the odd guy out. So, like, you're fighting against somebody that you, you might go to a small town in, in, in Russia. You know what I mean? And now you got to beat out whatever guy grew up in their club system. Mm. And he, his rope is a lot longer than yours in terms of what he can get away with. If you don't perform, you're out. Bring in the next American. He, he didn't work for us. Bring in the next one. And on top of that, you may or may not get paid. You may or may not get paid on time, even if you're doing your thing. Like, there's a lot of things where it's like, look, it's going to test you. Do you love it for real? You have to love it. And I, I can could, I could see how, you know, how that could be disheartening, for, especially if you've been a hot commodity mm -hmm. pretty much your whole run. And then you go from top of the food chain to you yeah, bottom right, of the barrel. <laughs> but that's, but that's, the, that's the love of it, though. Is that's, 
one of the one of the things one of my mentors told me was like this game will like it'll test you and it'll humble you. Mm-hmm. So no matter how high you get up the food chain, no matter how much you move, like okay, cool. Let's say you 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 go over to your first deal's pro B and you kill it. Okay, cool. Now you get to play pro A. You move up like mm-hmm. you're you just moved up a level and now you're at the bottom of that level. Okay, cool. Maybe you perform there. Now you move up to another level right. and you move up to another level and it's like this constant like if you don't have the ability to like to fight and and you really really want this. Like, you're going to fall off. Yeah. And that's okay. Like, some guys, I know a lot of guys that just want to be able to get the opportunity and be like, hey, I got to go play overseas. And, again, there's more to life than basketball. But for right. the ones that are chasing it, like, that would be my advice is, like, before you embark on this, make sure you love make sure you love the game. Mm-hmm. Make sure you love the work. Make sure you love all that comes with it because it's going to get – it's harder than you think it is. It's not just like, oh, I, I play overseas. You got to earn that. Yeah, you, you know just I mean? walk right into it. Because, you know, you're, you're coming out of – a lot of low, I mean, it'll be high D2 guys, low NAIA guys, guys like they can play. But it's like, man, he got that opportunity over me. Well, yeah, he came from a power five. Okay, you know, like that, that, that is what it is. It's a little bit more fast track. Yeah, you know but like, you got that gonna, look. I've seen a lot of, I've seen, but I've seen guys that start low D1 and guys that came out of power five and, and it shift really quick. You yeah. know what I mean? But again, maybe that guy, maybe this guy, the power five didn't love it like that and this guy did. And so his two or three years, he was just chasing the life. And this guy was actually, you know, chasing opportunities, chasing that, that chance to, 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 I guess, I won't say chase the work, but like love the game for real. Mm-hmm. It's just, it, it's going to test you, man. Speaking of the game, now we got to talk about you <laughs> and your playing days. When did the ball first start bouncing for you? When did you start playing basketball? Uh, four years old, Paradise Valley Community Center. Really? Oh, yeah. so then you, you, you're talking was, organized. Yeah. Well, I was playing, I mean, that, at that time, it was like it was a rec league. And then right. I guess, I mean, whatever it's worth. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I was one of the better kids in the rec league. Mm-hmm. So a couple like club coaches asked me to play and I started playing club and then turned to AAU and I played yeah. for a pretty good AAU team and it just naturally kind of grew from there. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate to play for a pretty good high school program too. Fortunate in, in the fact of like we were good. I got to play with some good players. Just fortunate in the fact of like I had to like sit behind some guys that were really good. Right. You know, and I, I was able to, you know, get an opportunity to go play at a, a smaller school in Iowa and I just, it wasn't for me. <laughs> transfer back home was like man i'm gonna do the juco thing because at the time when i came out of high school i didn't even know juco was a thing i didn't either, i wasn't man. put up on game about it but then i some mentors some coaches that i knew um put me on over there so i was able to play there mm. and again that that time all kind of intersected in terms of that's when i started coaching the aau stuff and working out some of my teammates and stuff like that and then i realized like i, I love this to the point of like i want to teach it i fell in love with teaching mm-hmm. you know but like i was the kid of like we used to hit you know, three pickup runs a day. Like, that that's the stuff I miss the most. It wouldn't be tired. Yeah, it wouldn't be tired. I miss the game. Like, obviously, I miss games, and I miss seasons and all that stuff, but I miss just, like, hoop, mm-hmm. just playing, man. Even now, like, it, it, it's funny. My girls will make fun of me, but sometimes I'll – we'll maybe do shell drill, and we need one more to jump in, and I'll get to play a little bit. And I try to tell girls, I'm like, look, y'all don't understand, but I miss this so much. I miss <laughs> this, the trash talk, the – like, and it's, it's just stuff like that that I think keeps me, like, like – going with this stuff is I love, like, I love shell drill. Like, I mm-hmm. love, you know, competing. I love all that one-on-one after practice. Yeah. Like, I love seeing girls do that. I mean, you got to be smart about it during the season, obviously. But, like, sure. I love, like, the extra shots, the – just stuff like that, man. Like, that's the stuff I miss the most, the pickup runs. Mm-hmm. Most of the mentors that I met in my life were, were guys that took me under their wing for pickup runs. And that's, I think, that's the love of the game that is missing a little bit now that I've noticed with some kids, mm-hmm. you know, as they've, they've – I don't know. They I don't just go hoop no more. Yeah, and that's that's I miss that the most, man. That's how we met. Yes, right. I that's caught right. I caught wind that there was a there was a, a pickup run, and I was like, man, I'm there because because yeah. I can't find one. Because one thing I learned about Oklahoma is if there's, if there's an Oklahoma football game, ain't nobody going to the gym that day. No, no, you forget about it. Yeah. Forget so to it. hear about that there was a run on a Saturday, I'm like, man, I just want to hoop, man. I don't even care if I suck now. Like I just want to hoop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you that that fire is still burning, and a lot of times my mind will tell me that I can do some things. And my body won't necessarily uh, yeah. respond as well. Like, whoa, 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 buddy! You know, you just went yesterday. You doing back to backs? Then Neil started knocking on that door. I'm like, yeah, man, right, I remember. I remember playing. Relax. I remember telling, telling you know our mutual friend. I remember we were playing, and I remember you were killing in the post. And I remember being like the dig man on the on the, on the low side. Mm. And I was kind of stunned at you, and you were looking at me, making eye contact, and the face you was giving me was very like, like come on, man. <laughs> but I missed like those interactions because I remember you, you skipped it over the top, and the man hit my shot, or sorry, hit his shot. But yeah. I just remember like. 
playing that game of like cat and mouse. Yeah. I'm stunned at you. That's you're right. waiting to make it. Boom. You make a, you made a left hand pass over the top. Dude hit the shot. Uh-huh. And I mean, I remember being like, okay, no, he got it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, that's what I miss is like those interactions, the yeah, man. whatever, arguing over a foul call, all that. Like all I miss that, that stuff. And, nah, and he's not going to commit for real. Yeah. I don't remember time. all that, man. I love it. And I'm going to tell you what's a while. I love playing for sure when, when it's, when it's guys of age and maybe even a little older, but they still got, they still got game. Mm-hmm. But that's almost equally as fun as playing with the young, spry guys yeah. <laughs> because from a mental standpoint I, I always feel like i have the edge yeah and talk them into something doing yep. something that's out of their character <laughs> or talk them out of doing something that they know they can do yeah and i'm just winning the psychological warfare baby yeah man. you know but i sent just... i sent a clip of uh there was a clip of it was uh, it was Kobe in practice and he and he talked Jeremy Lin to shoot a jump shot. He said, I talked you right into that dumb shit. And I'll send <laughs> that to like little 13, 14 year old kids that I'll play one on one with sometimes. Some of you guys I've had for a long time. For sure. Just messing around with them. But like, man, that's like that's 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 the fun in it, man. And the other thing I've learned too, my about to cut you off. That's the thing it's I've learned good. too, is uh one of my mentors told me this too. He was like, if you like I'ma always beat you. And then when you beat me, i I win regardless. Because he's like, if I'm beating you, obviously I'm winning. But the second you beat me, then I've won also. Because, I mean, I got you to the point if you were able to get over it. Because you know how it is with your big brother, your mentor. Yeah, like that, man. You take that very serious. Like, you need to finally beat them. Yeah, you need to conquer that. Yeah, man. So, I still, I still have that with, like, some of, the, <laughs> some of the guys I've had for a long time. It's like, yeah, you're beating me now. But, like, I guess I trained you to be good enough to do that. Which, yeah, you know, yeah. obviously, you know, and isn't always true. But it's, it's, it's fun, man. You know, I, I really hear that from fathers. Whenever it's like they they've been beating up on their sons yeah. basketball wise, and then eventually they get to the point to where, you know, the the student becomes the teacher, so to speak. And yeah, some yeah. of them some of them have a have a real hard time. Like man, my, my son finally beat me, and of course he's gonna celebrate big time. Yeah. And I've heard some fathers quit before it happens that they'll fake injuries. Ah, nah, my back, my back. Yeah. Man. Middle of the game, and then just we never finished the game, so you never beat me. Yeah. <laughs> that type of deal. I love it. Yeah, man. So now you said earlier, correct me if I'm wrong, you. Suffered an injury that sort of oh yeah I, I tore, tore the UCL in my in my hand. Um, I don't even know what that. Whoa, whoa, what is what is that? UCL. It's just, it just basically me doing my thumb. My, me move my thumb like this. That's a UCL. Uh-huh. So I got I got our last exhibition game. I, it was an exhibition game that I got um, I got bumped by a big. I put my hand down like this mm-hmm. and it, and it went. And Ooh. so I picked the ball up. Like I felt it. I picked the ball up and I swung it. And I looked down and my thumb was like kind of dangling. Because mm. I just completely dislocated, tore through the ligament. And someone, someone passed me the ball back, and I did a, a one dribble pull up, and I felt it like I felt it move more. And I, I, mean, I, I probably go find a clip, but I missed it. I remember running back down the floor, and I went like this, and I actually popped it back into place. Really? Yeah. Because I, I mean, I don't even remember doing it, but I remember our trainer was like messing with it. Yeah. And like my teammates were in the huddle, and our, our athletic trainer is going like this with it, and I'm looking up. So I'm standing here, she's working on it, and I look up, and my teammates are all like in the circle, mm. like looking at me, like, because my thumb is like, like it's just not moving how it's supposed to. Yeah. So wow. Um, was it super painful at all, or not really? It. Uh, I got lucky that I that I did that and kind of moved it back into place. But yeah, okay. it was painful after. And then it was crazy stuff because I couldn't open a door, and I couldn't open a water bottle. So like, if you think about like, if I have a water bottle right now and I try to open it, I couldn't. And I was like, oh no, this is not good. Like I need my thumb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they looked at it and they were like, hey, like if you want to get the surgery, like it's gonna be like like you're gonna miss the season. Because you have to get it completely repaired and, and all this stuff. And, like, at the time, like I said, that was our – we were about to start season. And yeah. they're like, maybe you can come back for the end of it. But, yeah. like, you're probably going to have to redshirt. Like, you're probably – and at the time, I'm like, man, like, <clears throat> like I, we, had a, we had a good group of guys. And I'm like, I want to play. Like, I want to I wanna go. So, I tried, to, I tried to thug it out. But I played the whole – basically the whole season with my hand wrapped. Mm. And then that's kind of like, again, the season ended. That opportunity came up with ASU. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to have to get a surgery. And then do I take, do I go play at a small NAIA or do I take this coaching job? Got you. So, I mean, in a way, it was a blessing in disguise because. Was it a hard decision for you to make, though? No, in the fact of I knew I wanted to coach. The fact it was that high of a level. Mm -hmm. And then also what I learned was, like, if I were to go, one of the schools is in California. So if I were to go um, and take this opportunity, I have this group of, at the time, they were 13, 14, 15. Still talk to all these kids to this day. I had 13, 14, 15-year-olds I was working with. And I remember them being like, so, like, if you leave, like, if you take this, are you still going to be able to train us? And I remember being like, as corny as this sounds, I remember being like, well, I can keep chasing this dream of hooping because, like, I don't know if I'm good enough to play pro. Maybe, probably not, but, like, do I really want to chase this? Or I can keep going here and still work with these guys kind of behind the scenes and whatever. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what, like, I really, really – 
at that point, I was invested in their development too. I'm like, man, I want to take this route. Like, I want to go with this option. Man. You know, do I, do I still, you know, sometimes be like, man, I wish I would have played just to play, but like, I, I've kind of gotten over that. Right. You know, what I used to be or what I used now. It's just like the fact that I had the opportunity to get those, those guys want to work with me, I think is what kind of stuck in my mind. Did you have anybody advising you through that process or it was just all you? It was, it was just me. I guess going back to parents earlier, that was another thing too. Like, hey, whatever you want to do, you know, do it. And I was like, all right, well, well if it's <laughs> me. That, that's, that doesn't help a lot. But yeah, I might. Yeah, we'll see how this, you know. But again, it was, I'm going I'm to just, I'm going to be honest. I, I saw the, the, I guess I just believed in like, I believe in a work ethic of like, if I get a chance, if I can get my foot in that door mm -hmm. at ASU and, you know, whatever school was a power five, I can get my foot in the door. I don't even know what I'm going to do. I might be handing out water bottles, which, again, going back to ego, I'd have to take that on the chin. But it's like I, I'm going to take this opportunity and run with it. Mm -hmm. And I guess it I guess it worked out. Seemed like a super humble dude, man. That's right, one, of the, one of the last questions I want to ask you. It seems like you're in you're in such a sweet spot right now. You know what I mean? In terms of doing exactly what it is you want to do. Mm -hmm. Not to rush you, but what's next or what is the ultimate goal for you? Is that even determined yet? I don't know if it's completely – I have some ideas. Gotcha. Uh, I, I do enjoy coaching, especially on the girls' side. All right. I love that. Um, I've been extremely, extremely fortunate to be around, quote-unquote, the NBA side of stuff and mm -hmm. see it for that, – that's that showed me a lot in terms of I've really fallen in love with the day-to-day -day process of what goes into making a high-level player a high-level player. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I've been really fortunate to, to lose trust in me to, to have Lou Dort trust me through his journey mm -hmm. and then see what it took, you know, we, maybe we can debate about it, but what I think is, I'm biased, but what I think is the greatest G League story ever in terms of where he is right now and where he started, like see what it took to get there. I've really fallen in love with the process of just player development. And so I don't know exactly what where that's going to lead. Um, you know, I'm smiling because I know I have a couple, couple – opportunities that you know maybe could work themselves out later down the road and stuff but again that's all all that stuff's contemporary i have mm -hmm. to keep going but something with player development i'm really you know again fortunate to have a, a staff that's entrusted me with that at the school i'm at now and i love it there you know by no means am i trying to get out like i love it there right. and, and i'm gonna i've tried to be very very conscious of being where my feet are and making the most out of this so key, man. You know, but I, 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 I think I found my niche a little bit in terms of communicating with players and coaching players and getting them to buy into not just what I'm saying, but buy into themselves. Because that's one thing that I've, I think I've found a niche for is getting people like you, you. The closer you get with players, the more you realize how much doubt there is in themselves. Because mm. there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, fronts that get put up social media is a part of that yeah, in like terms of fake confidence you know i'm trying to look like this i'm trying to look like this but you start talking to him you realize well i don't know if i can do that i don't think i can do that i don't think i can play at this level i don't think i could and really getting them especially on the girl side getting them to buy in of like no you can be that and this is what it takes and like i said that kind of goes back to even just like with lou like telling lou like no like you you can be an all-star i remember telling people like yo he's gonna win defensive player of the year like if if you keep going, like, you have the ability. I'm telling him this in the G League. And he's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I can. Like, yeah, I think I can. But I'm like, no, like, you can do this. You, can do this. you know what I'm saying? I'm like, you can absolutely do this. And now to see him going on that trajectory, it's just like kind of I've fallen in love with that, of seeing people, like, helping people get to – not just helping them get to where they want to go, but getting them beyond that, further than they even probably thought they could go. Part of the importance, I think, of a, of a job like the one that you do is that – you kind of got to see something in somebody that they don't even see. Yep. You know what I mean? And that's not, not to say that they're short on confidence, but sometimes it's like, man, you've done this for long enough to where it's like your foresight may go a little further than theirs does, even for themselves. I mean, I think it's, yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 it's a two, there's two different situations I think of. I think there's, there's the guy that wants to do it, but doesn't know what it takes. And then it's communicating, getting them to understand what it's really going to take. Mm -hmm. sacrifice I think is, is is the biggest thing and here's what you have to sacrifice to get to that level and you can do it but here's where you're not sac like here's here's the sacrifices you haven't been making and coming to them and being like look here's a here's a don't don't take my word for it here's three four five guys that maybe started a lower level than you or had harder harder starts or whatever you want to call it like 
that got there. But here's what they did, like communicating that. And then the other one is, is, is the, the 13, 14, 15 year old girl guy who just struggles with confidence. And then being like, no, you can do this, but it's gonna come from your work. You know what I mean? Like your, your confidence comes from the work you put in. So if you wanna be confident in that one day, we have to work at it. And I think what I've, what I've I don't wanna say I've mastered anything, but what I've really preached or, or tried to instill in players is let's create a space of like, it's okay to fuck up. Mm -hmm. If you train with me, you're going to hear that, you know, part of my language, but it's okay to, like, I want you to, because yep. if you're not struggling, if you're not making these mistakes, not getting out of your comfort zone. Yeah. You're too, you're too comfortable. So let's, let's create this space of like, we're going to go at this for an hour and we only work on one. We might work on a dribble handoff, like a pull up off a dribble handoff, but we're going to rep that religiously and we're going to work on it and you're going to mess up. You're going to get frustrated, but we're going to work on it. And you're going to be a little bit better than you were the day before. And we're going to come back at it and we're going to attack it tomorrow. We're going to attack it the next day. And I think I've just fallen in love with seeing that progression and everything that goes into that. When you're not Coach G, here's how we wrap it up. When you're <laughs> Greg Gilman, the man, all right? What are some of your hobbies? It's things that you do on your off time if such a time uh, exists, you know what I mean? Yeah, if it, I mean, film <laughs> takes up a lot of that, but yeah. Um, love music. Yeah. Big music guy. For sure. Love, I love... Uh, I think one thing I've fallen in love with is like, I guess, creative direction per se. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, a, a niche that I've kind of, I guess, had bestowed upon me a little bit is like building the brands of the players. Mm -hmm. And I'm not by no means am I an expert, but like figuring out like, if you start diving into what makes a player go, you start learning about their motivations. And motivations a lot of times comes from like their love. What do you love? Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you want to do? What do you want to represent? What do you want to, you know, I guess, inspire? Who do you want to inspire? And so, I've learned like, okay, these are the things you really like. How can we take that and communicate it? So in a weird way, like I love like even just helping with like players, like with the visuals behind the stuff that they do. And again, that's not the most important thing. Right. I think that social media messed a lot of that up in terms of people put more into like looking like they're working versus working, but just helping them be confident in like whatever it is you want to communicate or you want to put out there, like how can I help? Who can I connect you with? X, Y, Z. So that type of stuff. But like, I mean, really just, I guess it's art in a way. Yeah. I'm kind of weird about it. I love art. I love, I'm a movie guy, a little bit of a nerd. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Man. A little bit of a nerd. Same. You know, it's like I get a lot of flack about like, I'm a big Star Wars guy, Marvel guy, like all that stuff. Maybe I'm but, missing something. I've never watched Star Wars, not one time. Yeah, you know what I mean? That, man, yeah, <laughs> so I'm not going to knock it because I haven't even tried it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, people that watch this interview are going to laugh at the fact, like, how did you even, how did Star Wars get brought up in this? But I'm a, I'm a nerd <laughs> when it comes to that stuff, man, shows like, I've, I've learned to, uh, you got to break it up a little bit. That's yeah. one thing I've learned, you know, because if you're, if you're there, there's a little bit of Monday through Saturday, it's nonstop. It's film, it's constant, it's nonstop. But I've really tried to, the downtime maybe on Sundays or living with an NBA player scene, like people don't understand how important that off time is. You play 82 games, you have to really learn how to maximize your off time. Mm -hmm. And part of that is figuring out how do you remove yourself from basketball a little bit. Because it can get exhausting, especially when you're so mostly attached to it. You have to kind of build your identity outside of it. And that's another thing I try to do with my players is like, we're going to go as hard as we possibly can while we're on the court. But then off the court, like, what's your release outside of this? You know, like this can be your escape, your sanctuary, all that stuff as it was for me, as I'm sure it was for you. But mm -hmm. what else can you, can you, so that way it's not the end of the world when you don't play well. There you go. You know, like what else, what else? And I've, I've tried to help, help you know, especially with the players I have now, like I talk to these girls, some of these girls are juniors or seniors. Okay, well like, what else do you like outside of basketball? What do you want to do after basketball? Yeah, be a well-rounded person. Yeah, know? who can I introduce you to? Who can I, and I don't know everything, but I might know somebody that knows something. Mm -hmm. So who can I, you know, just, just all that stuff, man. I've, I try to tap more into, I'm, I'm trying to do better about it. My mom be on me about that, man. Like, <laughs> like stop, like you guys are still watching basketball. Like, yeah, mom, there's one more game on tonight. You gotta watch <laughs> that, that, that West Coast game. But nah, man, I've, I've, I'm a nerd in a lot of aspects. I feel it. Probably need to show a little bit more of that. Like you said, the human side of things, but you know. It is what it is. You get there. We get into it, man. But I'm gonna tell you something, man. You 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 have um you definitely found your niche, my man. And it's like I think whenever you I think we've all found a great thing once we get to the point where we are doing actually what we love to do. And it Absolutely. seems like I can just hear when you speak, man. You're loving what you're doing. So I'm glad we finally got to sit down and connect on this. We're about two two years. Two years late. late. Man. But it's it's right. crazy, man, because I remember talking to you uh about I remember asking about like if they had any runs out here, right? And uh, you had mentioned that there was like oh they play pickup sometimes the girls play pickup in here and all mm -hmm. that stuff and you know in those last two years I think seeing 
what we've been able to build in Arizona in terms of girls pickup run and all that stuff we built out there, man, it's been cool to, you know, two years ago that wasn't, that didn't exist. Nah. And now, and now to see like we've built, you know, so much has been built since then. Mm -hmm. and again, you know, seeing, obviously I'm out in Oklahoma because of Lou, seeing what the man he's grown into, mm -hmm. the things he's built, the, the, the team he's built around him, even with Sean now who's with us, seeing the stuff he's built, but the girls, See, even two years ago, some of the girls that I was training aren't playing anymore. They've, they've since moved on from basketball, but even just seeing the, the people that they become and then all these girls that are coming in after. And obviously, you know, with me coaching now, it's a little bit different in terms of my involvement with that stuff. But just seeing what's grown out of it, mm -hmm. it's been it's been cool, man. This game can do a lot for you. It took, took me everywhere I've been. Everything I have, I owe it to the game, man. So, Oh, I love, can't say it no better than yes, that. That's the love of my life, man. Yes, I, sir. I, Yes, sir, absolutely. Well, brother, I appreciate the time. Sir, it's been a pleasure. Best of luck, continued sir. success, and we're going to connect down the road. Absolutely, man.